Today's episode of Running It Back is here, right here, right now. Joining me on the episode today, fun, fun one. I'm glad we did this one. I really am. Uh, Robert Pitty is on the show with me today. Who is Robert Pitty, you ask? Well, Robert Pitty is a comic based in Seattle. He was the general manager of the Comedy Underground. And most importantly, his family let me stay with them when I did the Seattle Comedy Festival years back. So not only do I know Robert Pitty, I know Robert Pitty's mom and dad because they let me stay in their house. So we dive into that. We talk about his parents. We talk about his dad taking me jogging. We talk about eggs. And we get into a spirited round of the Rotten Tomatoes head-to-head game. I don't know if you know this, but it's heating up who's done well in this game and who hasn't. So we have a special Pacific Northwest edition of the Rotten Tomatoes head-to-head game. Hey, before that, though, if you haven't already, check out my other show on my YouTube channel called The Sunday Night Talk. We're on to the Super Bowl. We talk sports. A couple shows left in the season. It is heating up. Not to mention the football movie bracket is happening right now. We're on to the Super Bowl with that too, head to head. So go listen to that show. See who's in it. Right now though, get ready. Put on your rain jackets. Lace up your rain boots. And you better hope you have your water repellent tires on your car. Because we're going Seattle. My conversation with me and Robert Pitty right now. All right, join me this week on the pod, Robert Pity. It's been about a million years. Since I, say, I, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, 2020 is one million years, so it's been probably one million and one years for us, right? Yeah, 2020 is going to have the ultimate footnote in Wikipedia mm-hmm. uh, as far as its description. It's going to say footnote, felt like a million years. Uh, we lost our minds about 18 different mm-hmm. times. And I think the term end of the world was uttered about maybe 27 million times. Oh, yeah, for sure. I like that everyone in 2020 aged the way, like, you, you ever seen pictures of someone who's been on the Barren Sea? And it's like it, for every one year they're at, or every three months they're out there, it counts for like two years of their life. 2020 <laughs> was essentially that, where I, before this, I had, I had hair. I want everyone <laughs> to know that. I had what happened? Very long. Um, Golden blonde hair that looked very good. I was compared to Seinfeld back in the day as far as my look and my demeanor. And uh, times changed. Uh, COVID happened. Uh, and now I'm here. You and should just walk me. around all 2021 going like, 2020, dude. Look yeah, what exactly. happened. Why? Why? Uh, this was full. This was full before all that happened. Um, and now <laughs> this it was full. Exactly. It, it looks like a weed field that got plowed over, like just in specific spots. Like somebody didn't commit to Field of Dreams, where they were just like, ah, I mean, I'm hearing the voice, but like, it's still pretty stupid for me to build a baseball field. I'm going to backtrack on this. Yeah, he quit at second base. Yep, exactly. He was like, ah, we're out of funds. I mean, they can still shag balls. And exactly. what, if, what if he quit halfway through and then like just not legendary players or teams and stuff like that, but just like, uh, the triple a squad of those teams that nobody knew about whatsoever just show up and like you guys why would anyone come to watch you guys and they're like well we're old but we're also young and they're like i mean yeah but no one really cared when you were here so <laughs> feel the dreams is definitely one of those movies that might have never gotten off the ground if his wife just let him get a pool table it could have right? Yeah, like just a mid, I wonder what my midlife crisis voice is going to say, where it's just like, build a moat. I'm like, I don't, mm, mm, why? Why do I need to build a moat? Well, what if the dark night comes? And I'm like, well, it hasn't come up recently for anyone I know, but you know, this voice, no one knows what's going to happen when I hit my 40s. A moat is not bad. I'm, I'm 40 and I, and I would like to, you know how they say you can't choose your parents. Can you choose your midlife crisis? Because I don't think you can. can, And if you could, I think I could do way better with it. 
having had the choice. What, what, okay. Do you think that you've hit your midlife crisis or do you, because also I did not know you were in your forties. You, you look really good for your forties. So you look exactly like I do when I'm 31 years old. <laughs> well, I mean, I attribute to, um, diet exercise and uh, a whole lot of cocaine. So take it where you want to go and, uh, hey. you can look young too. So all I'm missing is cocaine. All right. Yeah. I, I didn't know that uh, the Fountain of Youth was in an eight ball, but you know what? Okay, cool. Yeah, but I did read on the back of one of the bottles that said there will be a very severe drop off at some point. Doesn't tell you where. Okay. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to yours because I am very, like, <laughs> I am, I, I am, what, what's the word? Unnerved by, the, by your youth or seeming youth. Well, let me be your coked up canary in the coal mine. <laughs> <laughs> you, you work off of me. Okay. But last time I saw you, uh, I was getting to perform at the Comedy Underground. Yeah. You were there. Um, you were, here's what you were doing when you were there. You were taking tickets. You were seating people. Yeah. I think you took a few food orders. And then I think you hosted the show or performed on the show uh, as well. I, I, I'm the, I, was, I was the general manager of the Comedy Underground, and you're right. I did everything for that place for a long period of time. There was actually one night, um, very specifically, where I did, in fact, do everything at the Comedy Underground because I didn't think we would have a show. So I sent the cook. The cook couldn't make it in because it was a huge snowstorm. That's why I was like, yeah, no one come in. So the feature and the headliner show up. Um, just to, in case there's, we have to have more than 10 people for a show. I send home the ticket guy, the host, the bartender, the cook. I heat up the food just in case that we have to do an order of nachos. And we had four pre-orders. So I'm like, I literally sat there and then 10 minutes before the show, no one was there. I was about to just lock the door and go home. And then 12 people come in out of the cold just to have a place to stay for a little while. I'm like, well, it's fifteen dollars a show, and they're like, yeah, we want, and they all had thick uh, Russian accents too. Uh, every single one had th a thick Russian accent, and so I, I literally like some people will will do more than one job at a comedy show. No, I literally ran an entire comedy club on my own, um, <laughs> and it was one of the great. The other fun part, I had never bartended before that night, um, so literally the. Or, I even told them, I'm like, if you order like just a crayon and vodka, great. You're fantastic. And then they're like, no, we want the cocktails. The cocktails right here. And I'm like, um, all right, you're going to get those ingredients that are in there. I don't know how much of each goes in. Um, I do know that whatever they ordered looked like what it was supposed to. Like some of them would order like a purple rain and they got a drink that was purple. And that felt like the accomplishment. <laughs> So you should have just given them the vodka with like a, like a lemon in it. And be like, I ordered the Mai Tai. This is a Mai Tai. I don't know how you Russians do it, but here in America, this is our Mai Tai. Would they have known? We don't know. I would know. have absolutely done that if I didn't have to host. That's the thing. Like I would have been the worst server bartender. I would have done all those things, but the, just the part of me that wants people to like me, which worse they didn't. They abs. When I was on stage, I, like I let them know that like I was the only person there. I even let that them know that before I sat. And I remember opening to them and being like, "By the way, if you want to order the host a drink, the bartender cut him off because he gets really handsy with the servers, and he's already sleeping with the cook. It's crazy. <laughs> the guy's insatiable." And they didn't laugh at all at that <laughs> moment. And in you know what's even worse is bombing on stage for 10 minutes and then having to go into that sort of service industry. What can I get oh, you? I didn't what? even think of that. Oh That's yeah, true. no, it's way worse when you're disheartened that they don't like you and what you consider funny. And then you <laughs> immediately have to go into, and what can I do for you person that doesn't <laughs> value me as, but in a deep philosophical manner. <laughs> What can I get for you, person who thinks I have no sense of humor, yet I've devoted a huge amount of time to developing a sense of humor? I'm literally only doing this just to be able to, to do it. Like it literally. That is a new level of bombing. People talk about like, mm -hmm. oh, I bombed and I had to walk through the crowd. 
that's nothing. You had no. to you had to bomb and go like, so who's ready to order? Yeah. What do you guys want? Oh, I'm sorry. I probably broke those burgers. I put them on before I was supposed to go on stage. So I'm gonna just go back in there. That is tough. You are tough, man. That's a new level of thick skin that I don't think a lot of comics have. I don't I, I would agree a hundred percent with that. I, I have done some pretty ridiculous things for stage time. Uh, run an entire comedy club is one of them. Um, yeah. Well, um, we should say you're a Seattle based comic. I met you when I went to Seattle to do the comedy festival and then you, you worked and managed the comedy underground. Yep. Which is a longstanding club there, but yep. let, let's go, let's go way back we, before mm -hmm. comedy, before you started comedy, what were you doing? What, what age were you? How did you, I was you living before then. Before then, I was a college student. I went to Central Washington University to uh, to be a teacher. That was originally my idea of what oh. I was going to do before I found out I was addicted to making strangers laugh at my dick jokes. And I actually switched majors over into philosophy with a minor in theater just to be able to be ready to do stand-up comedy because I I was I was so what's the word. I was funny. I was relatively funny to begin stand-up comedy, which was a fucking curse uh, because I was funny over in Ellensburg, which is a very, it's a truck stop that happens to have a college at it um, in the middle of Washington. And I, I did well. That was a really, like, they really cursed me. Um, yeah, with people design. don't know when you start comedy, one of the worst things that can happen to you is you do well early. <laughs> yeah, it, is, yeah. it is the most backward sort of experience. It's like, yeah. you don't want to do well early. That mm -hmm. is the worst. Yeah, and it, the, the worst part was, was like, I got done, like, and I wrote for a good period of time because I loved stand-up comedy even before then. Um, like, the goal was always go into education or this, I think most comedians have this sort of nagging thing in the back of their head that tells them that, I think, it's not just comedians. It's also people who just don't want to put themselves out there, but they have that sort of, well, if you wanted to, you still, you, you could write a type three for sure. Um, mm -hmm. And that was like, I wrote for probably two, two and a half years or so before I actually did stand up. And I wrote one joke uh, that I was like, no, that's a really, really good joke. Um, and if I say th those words in that order, it'll work. And then a guy got up in the middle of a philosophy course and was like, hey, I'm in a band. I need an opener. Is anybody here available? Which was ridiculous to do it. Like why he did it in a philosophy course versus going down to the theater department or the musical, anywhere. He could have gone anywhere else. But I, I was like, no, I'll do it. I'm a comedian, which was a bold faced lie, but it worked. Mm -hmm. um, and don't open for a band your first time. That's not a good way to, it's not even fun to do that now that I'm good at stand-up. Um, no one's there to see you. They don't know why you're doing what you're doing. They're only there because their friend is in that band and they want to see them do what they do. And they're kind of like, it's kind of like a parent going to the ballet recital just to see their kid knowing they're up early and is gonna ditch right after except for you're the kids in the way to see that. And that was me with my jokes. And that was your very first yep. uh, attempting stand-up. Yeah. And, and unfortunately it went relatively okay. Um, oh, interesting. Yep. I had terrible stage fright. I wore a, uh, I wore my high school prom tuxedo, which went up to here on my arm, just as far as like the sleeve. You wore a tuxedo, wow. Yep, I went full tuxedo. Um, I wore Vans on stage because I didn't have good shoes. I still don't, I don't know what, like I have a really decent suit now. I don't have good shoes to go with it. Um, and I kind of prefer it that way. It's silly, it's sillier that way. Um, <laughs> But, uh, and I had these, uh, the thing that really saved my ass was that I had these cue cards with little lines on them. I was kind of doing a Dimitri Martin one-liner or what I thought was Dimitri Martin one-liner style of comedy where I would, like, I would, I knew I was going to forget lines and stuff like that. So I had these key cards with words on them for the title of the joke. And I would look down at these cards and I would get a laugh every single time I looked down at the cards because they thought I was doing these bad jokes and seeming professional ironically which i wasn't right but 
it was funny enough that they were like, huh, this guy is really one of us. He's totally, he's totally <laughs> making fun of the craft just at a meta level. And I'm like, no, I really want this <laughs> on the inside. But there, there should really be a category called accidental meta. Yep. Yep. I, and I think I've almost seen it happen more times than someone actually oh, for sure. trying to be meta. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it was such a fun, like, and unfortunately those laughs fueled me to go, I'm going to be a great comedian when I get to <laughs> Seattle. And, <laughs> and it, uh, it wasn't that bad. Actually, I, I walked in, got my ass kicked for a little while, but then specifically the comedy underground was like, no, he's actually, he's going to be good. He's young and he like actually works on this. Um, yeah. But that's how you got your your yeah. start into it. So you wanted to be a teacher in college? Uh, yeah, I even still like I, I'm working on uh, being a little league coach while I'm out of comedy and stuff like that. Like I still love kids and stuff like that. Um, I'm great with them. Really feel like I understand like how to communicate with them very effectively in a way that gets ideas across and in a way that is sort of fun, accepting, like it, uh, that's, that's still a really big part of who I am as a person. So, so it's so interesting. You say the teaching route, it seems comics yeah. before comedy or mm -hmm. during comedy either become teachers or yeah. work retail. Yeah. <laughs> it's that, it's yeah, that sure. big a chasm. Yeah. But I hear the English major so often, the creative writing major so often with mm -hmm. the comics, the comics that went to college, that is. And yeah. teaching is is a lot a majority profession for a lot of them as they're kind of working their way through it. Either that or retail. It seems mm -hmm. I went the retail route, and yeah. everybody else <laughs> went the teaching route. I wonder what that is about the sense of humor person that also has a is it is it the uh, an audience you think potentially you have an audience to teach to? I think it's just a level of knowing that you can communicate effectively. I really think that it's this uh, part of you that goes, oh, when I talk people listen and understand me. And just even having that as a tool is an amazing jumping off point for you uh, starting, at, at least for a teacher at the retail. It's funny that you say retail because I literally went the other direction come, becoming the GM at the Comedy Underground because I, I never intended to live this life. Um, I was all, the whole goal, like even at the comedy underground, I worked the door. I worked as the comedy. I, well, let's see. I've been fired from there two times. I quit once, and then <laughs> I became the GM. So it's it's a very strange. I technically quit twice. Now that I think about it, I even quit as GM once. So really, it, wow. It's it's interesting that uh, like there was I, I've had this whole cycle, and I never intended to be in this uh, situation. <laughs> this sounds um, like the back of a book cover where you're like. I quit, got fired twice, got laid off, and now I own the place. <laughs> it seems like that's the next surprised. step, Robert. <laughs> I, I really wouldn't be surprised if that's the exact direction. Thing <laughs> I go. burned the place to the ground, rebuilt it, claimed insurance, and now <laughs> guess who owns 13 chains? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, you know, that's it's an American dream. It's also sometimes my nightmare, but it's also. Uh, <laughs> People some, forget dreams can also be nightmares. Exactly. Uh, it's that one man's trash can be another man's nightmare. Um, <laughs> one man's trash can be another man's, uh, well, trash. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you're living in, you said this is outside of Seattle. Where were you living at the time? Uh, it was in Ellensburg, Washington. Uh, is that where you're from? No, no, I'm from uh, Burien, Washington. I'm in Kent right now, which is pretty adjacent to it. Uh, I'm living with my mom while, you know, the whole unemployed thing. So I, I can't, I can't travel as a comedian or anything like that. So it's, right. uh, it's been difficult. Um, Zoom, uh, I just started doing Zoom shows. I've been, I've been writing in the meantime, but it's, uh, it sucked. it's, yeah. it's hard. It's truly been a, a what would you call it a weeding out year mm -hmm. we're gonna see when all the dust settles yeah we're gonna see who did the most with their time and we're gonna see who did the least with their time exactly and we all know the zoom comedy shows are not ideal they're very different oh. they're yeah. not they're not comedy as we know it however it's it's really all we got if i said all right go work out here's an eight pound weight you better think of some workouts to do with that eight pound weight Yep. So 
it's a really, really, you know, make the most out of what you got for this oh, year. For, sure. for um, me, it just feels like diet stand up. Like that. Mm -hmm. Like that's it, a good it, way of putting it. Yeah, all all the ingredients are there. Uh, maybe some aspartame, um, and you just make do with it. Where it's like it's not exact. It's never going to taste exactly like what you really want because you want the sugars and stuff like that. But you're thirsty, so mm -hmm. drink. Yeah, you have to. You'll take whatever. We're in the we're in the comedy desert, and this is a drop of water. Yeah, exactly. And it, and it will. It is. It is some form of substance. The mm -hmm. tricky part with Zoom is now you you question your jokes in a totally different way. You See, go, all right. I didn't want to do. That's <laughs> like literally, I just started doing Zoom comedy. Um, it, I made it ten months. I was super fortunate to, um, before Washington completely closed down, I got to do a forty-five minute set over in Whidbey Island. Uh, like three months after not doing stand-up for a long period of time. And I think that a lot of comedians are really scared of like, am I going to be funny or remember my jokes? I'm like, I didn't remember my jokes 100% for 45 minutes, but you, but I was still funny enough to where I was like, okay, I'll come back and I'll be fine. It's, right. And right. It, it was that kind of like, I've, I've been to the oasis. I've gotten as much as I need to know that when I come back, it'll be fine. But also... Oh, it's been a lot like, but then, then I had to wander through the desert for another seven months. I'm like, I guess I'll start doing zoom comedy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've had this, a similar experience. And then this is what I question myself. Now, when you do your jokes, mm -hmm. when a joke doesn't do good, you go, Oh wait, bad joke or audio delay. And yeah. <laughs> you, ne you never answer the question. Yeah. <laughs> you know? You don't mm -hmm. get it. You tell the joke and then you got to wait for the audio to come in. My, and then we've kind of learned new strategies mm -hmm. with Zoom. My, the one I have found is number one, you have to take, it's helpful to take the audience uh, perspective out of it. Instead of thinking you're speaking to an audience, think you're speaking to one person. Think yep. of it more radio instead of live performance. Mm -hmm. And then we're just in dealing with the technology, with the delay, someone said, just step on your own punchlines. When you say, so I told this guy, uh, um, it happens on this day now, and then into the next one. And then this yeah. happened. And then this guy, well, so, you know, you're, we're all waiting for the laughs, but they happen in a different time frame since we're yeah. on this technology. Yeah. So as soon as he says like, step on your own punchline and keep rolling, I was like, oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. I never would have figured that out yep. on my own. The other tricky part is I've heard people ha say both, both versions of this, when they do the, their actual set to mm -hmm. the computer, mm -hmm. some prefer to have it on the gallery view so they can see all the faces mm -hmm. and some prefer to have it like, just have it on yourself. Just look, yeah. you're looking at yourself and that might take the edge off because you're, you don't gravitate to the one face that is yeah. obviously texting or something. Mm -hmm. And then I love when the set's done and like, all right, good job, everybody. You're like, all right, great. That was fun. And you, and then you log off and then you're staring at your wall with your bathrobe hanging on the door. <laughs> you're like, all right, I'm still in my apartment. Yep. Yep. It, I mean, you, it, it's weird that you do still have that sort of out of body situation where like, it, it is weird that adrenaline hits in your own home, not in the same way, obviously, as with a real crowd, but there is that sort of, oh, I got to get up for this. And then you tune out everything around you to sort of really put on the show. And it's weird that you still come out of it and you have a pot of boiling ramen behind you that you yeah. need to attend to <laughs> mid-open mic. I like the guy who is either watching the show or waiting for his turn and he's eating. <laughs> like, yeah. You couldn't give it 17 minutes, man. <laughs> you couldn't. Yeah, and I've, I have definitely been that person. <laughs> I, I've been that person in the middle of a real show where it's like I lost. And then I was like, like I had a Papa Murphy's pizza and they're doing the quote unquote loser interviews. And I, I was just nomming on the pizza the whole entire time. We're like, I mean, I'm not getting the $25. I know that. I don't know why you're asking me to dance anymore. Um, yeah, you you get a pass from me for that though. That's that's stress eating. That's comfort food eating. Mm -hmm. That's there's no there's no shame in that. Plus that pizza yeah. sounds good. Uh, it was uh, cowboy pizza from Papa Murphy's. I'm not gonna plug them, but it, it's my mom's favorite. I get it my side with no olives. It's a whole thing. So you got the cowboy cowboy pizza. What's on a cowboy pizza? Are we cowboy are pizza? 
Uh, let's see. It's pretty much just a normal pizza with uh, oh. <laughs> mushrooms, mushrooms, olives, pepperoni, sausage, and I think that's it. I think. Well, what's and, the uh, cowboy just, part? I don't know. Uh, I think that you somebody just, stepped on it with a boot on. That's the cowboy part. I, I mean, maybe like there's this robust town where all they had to live on was pepperoni, sausage, olives. Uh, I haven't read that Western before, um, but mm. I imagine that there has to be some form of cultural uh, like reasoning behind it. There has to be. But then again, yeah. why do you call like a cowboy burger that has a fried onion ring and barbecue sauce? Why is that a cowboy thing? I, yeah. I like the barbecue, I guess, because there's a grill involved. I, I, I'm not totally sure. I'm not it's totally very, sure. It's very regional too. One, one part of the country's Western could mean something else yeah. than another, than, you know, than Texas Western. Yeah. So it could be a regional thing. I do know one time when I was, visiting i want to say a friend somewhere in oklahoma mm -hmm. and he said like we're going for mexican food tonight i was like sounds good to me and we went to a fast food restaurant called mexico <laughs> and and he was he was telling me we were going <laughs> to this restaurant like it was a treat I was yeah. like mexico and he's like oh yeah you ready for this I'm like, I, I am not ready for this <laughs> I <laughs> Very I was original. ready for this and I was overprepared by such a large margin. <laughs> Overpromised. Not a bad, <laughs> bad way to go. Well, you're doing comedy and somewhere along the line, our paths cross yep. circa, I want to say 2014 ish, 2015, maybe. Uh, uh, if it was that long ago, then I was still relatively new. I wasn't even GM of the underground yet. No, um, I, I don't think you were. I don't, um, I don't think, oh, you were. Was I? I, yeah, I think that I was just the uh, door guy that they needed a host for then. Uh, yeah. That. I know you were doing comedy and stuff. Cause we talked about it. Yep. But I, was, I think I was, I was still two years in at that point. Yeah. And, I was doing the Seattle comedy festival. Yep. So I go to Seattle to do it. And then, but our paths crossed because I stayed for the festival, which was like five days at your yep. parents' house. Yep. Your parents put up comics Yep. And you stay with them. And it's, it's really weird, but I've done this through uh, sports back in the day. You would travel mm -hmm. around and yep. you would stay with host housing and you end up meeting some of the nicest people you were ever, ever meet in yep. host housing. Yeah. They're down to let strangers come in their home, yep. sleep in their beds. So you don't have to purchase hotels. And then yep. here's the thing with, with your parents at some point in the morning, me and another guy are staying there and we go, um, all right, let's go to Starbucks, get some breakfast. And your dad sees us walking. I was like, where are you guys going? We're going to go to Starbucks. We're going to get some breakfast. No, you're not. Sit down. Bacon and eggs. And we just, both of yep. us instantly go, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> and we sit yep. down and your dad starts cooking bacon and eggs. And That's a, that, that is 100% the authority that my dad commands. The, no, we will be hospitable. Um, at uh, even if it's in that that deep like no right like he he has a tone that is always a little bit um, not disappointed but just this is what we do now and it's yeah. uh, it's fun. It was great. He was like, "No, you're not. We're have, you're sitting down, bacon and yeah. eggs." And yeah. he, I think he meant to say bacon and eggs question mark, but it came out bacon and no. eggs yeah, no. I, it, it, no no my dad does not question if he's making bacon and eggs he is questioning how he is, I, i'm at my dad's place right now there is mostly just bacon and eggs here to make so when you actually say bacon and eggs i'm like yeah that story is congruent with i'd say 50 percent of breakfast here at the pity house mm -hmm. so that's kind of what we subsist off of in general so yeah. it isn't a question of if somebody comes into our home and there is breakfast, it is likely bacon and eggs. <clears throat> I've exactly, exactly right. And then for people who don't know, the comedy festival is, I think it's five days and you go to yeah. like a new kind of nearby city yep. every night and you do a different show. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, you sort of wait around all day for the show that night. You go to sleep. Yep. The next day you wait around all day show so at some point you get kind of stir crazy yep. and i start i start like jogging around your parents neighborhood just for exercise yeah and i do that like two days in a row 
And then the third day, your dad goes, are you going jogging again? And I go, uh, yeah. Hey, I know a place to go jogging. And I think he's going to like take yeah. me to a place like a park. He takes me to a trail yeah. and he takes off. Yep. And I, and I have to go <laughs> chase him. Not yeah. because like, I want to chase him competitively. I want to chase him because I, so I don't get lost. Yep. In the, yep. In the woods. Cedar Trail. Yep. That's his, that's, that's both of our favorite trail to run. It is. Uh, yeah. He takes me this awesome trail, but I can't yep. enjoy it because I'm chasing this, yep. this middle aged man because I don't want to get lost in the woods yep. like in Blair Witch Project. Yep. Oh, that is, yep. That, that, that adds up 100% with my, <laughs> with my family. And the general experience you will feel is we have the intention to bring you somewhere that is better. Um, but we don't know how to actually present it. Um, it, it. That's generally the, oh, we have this really cool thing that is really awesome if you know what we're going to do with it. But then people show up and they're like, I mean, we've never done this before. And we're like, well, we're going right now. So <laughs> catch up or be left behind because I'm having an awesome time. Yeah, that's what it felt like. I was like, oh, he's not taking me jogging. He's going jogging and I can just choose to join if I want. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that sounds about right. Yeah, your dad just takes off on a trail and I'm chasing this man yep. just so I don't get lost because he said, are you going? And he said, when he started it, he almost said almost, you're going jogging again today? And that was almost like, uh, no. <laughs> I almost said, no, I didn't know if he disapproved <laughs> or what. I couldn't yeah. figure out your dad's tone for those five yeah. days. Yeah, no, he is, uh, he's half deaf. Uh, he's worked around airline engines for a long period of time. So he has this booming, strong voice that I don't think that he actually hears the way that it comes out from time to time. And so it is usually that authoritative dad. Um, and it feels judgmental, but at the same time, he's actually just inquiring. Um, it's, it's a weird, mm. like, if you don't know, you, it's really weird to get, it, it's hard to get used to. Um, but he, he very much means the best by him. How is it growing up or how is it with your folks in comedy? Because I, I found them to be just immensely supportive people. Yep. Uh, that they, is a hundred percent. They have been, they expect me to be a great comedian and stuff like that. And they have been very willing to <clears throat> be as supportive as possible while I continue. Like as long as I'm not like, Slacking feels like a strange word because I, I very much want to be a comedian and stuff like that. But as long as I'm not like really obviously taking advantage of the support that I'm being given, because I mean, I, I do still help out around the house, do like pretty physical labor and stuff like that for them. But it's really not much uh, compared to the amount of things that they do for me in general. Um, and the hardest part about this whole entire quarantine was I was in such a great position as the GM at the underground to move out of their place, be done. Uh, like I, I had my own, I had savings, like a, in a, a very solid amount of savings that I've been able to maintain through this entire thing. Um, and I was ready to quit, finally be the comedian that I wanted to be. And then the pandemic hit. And now I'm thinking, ah, it was a good job. It was a good job. If I could have it back, I would love it. Um, mm -hmm. but there's also the part of me that's like, but this also could be the reason why I can finally be a comedian. Uh, so we'll see. We'll yeah. see. Yeah. We're still, we're still in flux yep. with this whole year in general. We're still yeah. kind of trying to round third essentially. Yeah. And then oh, figure it all out. I think we're rounding second. That's the worst part is I think that if we can get all the vaccines out by the end of the year, I'd be pretty happy. With that. I feel like we're at bat and it's a two one count and the pitcher is having a conference with the catcher. <laughs> Let's see how far we can take this analogy. That you know that feels about right. <laughs> okay, two one count. Yeah, two one count, uh, except for I. That's a hitter's count. <laughs> it's, it is a hitter's count, and that's one of the reasons why I'm like ah, it feels like it might be the beginning of the at bat. Just completely. <laughs> And we've had a lot of at-bats. That's the worst part. That's is true. Had, this is our third at-bat of the game. Yeah. Yep, exactly. There's been a lot of hope. They've gone up and down the lineup and nobody's gotten on base at all. And <laughs> right. No one's been on base yet. That's true. Nope. We, we, we all just been sitting here like, I mean, is anybody going to hit this guy? And so far, I, I mean, 
the vaccine showed hope. It feels like a very long fly ball. We're like, oh, hey, someone Ooh, made contact. It's a deep fly Ooh. right now, right? Yeah. We don't know if it's going to make it to the to the fence yeah. or it's going to be caught at the track. That's yeah. true. That's, a, that's the best one. It's a deep yeah. fly right now. Yeah, that's, I think that's, uh, yeah, definitely. Ooh, how about this one? How about this one? It's a seven-game series. We're down 3-1, but now we're going home. And we got Ooh. we got a good home record. Ooh, ooh! I it, it depends on who's pitching, but I mm. uh, see. And because of like the lack of like they're like we don't even know how many vaccines we even have. And like the government at this point has said we don't know how many vaccines we have. That's one of the reasons why I'm like I fear to say that we even got one of those wins and we're down three zero zero three. But, oh, okay. But I mean, the thing is, though, is that inevitably, because of medical progression and stuff like that, like, I know that it seems like we're going to lose the series because we're down 03. Like, that's part of the part of the analogy that I'm like, but here's the thing is, we know that eventually, things will move on, and we will right. technically have won at some point. Mm -hmm. So, so just maybe we plan. lose the series, but now we're yep. set up for a good draft pick. There we go. There we go. Maybe that's yeah. how we need to think. Okay, this season is a wash, but if we start oh, that's a, that's now. A, that's definitely what 2020 was. That was a wash. This was, was a, our tank season. Yeah, Yeah, that was our tank season for sure. All right, we're going to tank it for Trevor Lawrence 2021 season. Yep. <laughs> tank it. That's a good analogy. I had. I got one more. Say we're a college team and we split the first eight games of our season. We're four and four. Uh, maybe we're, maybe we're even three and five, but we're going into the easy part of the schedule now. Okay. So we, can, we can rebound. We can rebound. If we really get on it and we really focus, we can win the second half of the season. That adds up. Yeah. Like we got to like a lot of middle Tennessee States on our schedule. <laughs> we, got, we got a uh, mountain West uh, central uh, game. Middle Appalachian State. Home. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we got a, uh, what's the, uh, what's the, we got an Appalachian State. Yes. Ahead of us. We can win that game. We can win. Yeah. That's winnable. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do we start on this? Oh, your dad making eggs. <laughs> yeah, my dad, my dad told you, are you going jogging again? That's right. That's where we started. That's right. Yeah. I think what, there was one more thing with your dad I had. I think it was, oh yeah, yeah. It's the last night of the festival, which mm -hmm. I think is at the Comedy Underground. Yep typically club and by this time of the festival i i'm burnt i have done yep. i have done bottom and they rank you for people who don't know you get a ranking every, every night. night so every night somebody is high as a kite and somebody is low as can be yep and someone i've done i've done um sports and my sport was cycling and mm -hmm. every time you did a five-day race everybody comes into that first stage of the race i'm going to do top 10 I'm fast at home. I'm mm -hmm. gonna be good. Blah blah. Cut to end of the race, and you see yourself at the bottom of the res results list. You're like, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. This is terrible. I'm yeah. gonna look at grad schools when I get home. You know what? Yeah. I'm selling. I'm selling all my spare stuff. I'm gonna focus on work. So you go through yeah. the gamut of emotion. So think of that for five days. The last day, I think I finished my my set, and your parents go to this show, and your dad gives me a huge hug. And I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank you. And he's like, yeah. oh, great job. Great job. I'm like, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Pity. Thanks. And then he goes, yeah, I didn't catch your set, but great job. Great job. <laughs> <laughs> didn't even see my set. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that, that adds up hundred percent. I needed it. I needed it. Oh. I was, I was spent that week and your dad and mom give me a hug and I was like, oh, it's okay. And then they didn't even watch my set. Yep. Yep. That's... Didn't matter at that point though. Nope. No, it didn't. Um, I, as somebody who, uh, the very last night uh, that I did the Seattle National Comedy Competition, I was in 15th place uh, going into mm. the very last night, which no way I'm making top five. Absolutely Simpatico. no way. I think I was the same way. Yep. And so I decided to do, uh, I was at Whidbey Island, and I decided to go full suit for it. Um, I, I, I suited up for it, wore my nicest thing. And I think I opened my set by saying this is what a comedian looks like who has zero chance of placing, but it's going to do their best anyways. And mm -hmm. 
the audience did not laugh at that but I could hear the comedians in the back absolutely losing their shit over just that line. And so I decided like instantly in that moment, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do the jokes. I know they didn't want me to do for this whole entire competition. And each and every one, I can hear the comedians in the back. I did okay on the front. Uh, I took last place for that to show because the judges fucking hated me. Um, but I could hear the comedians absolutely rolling in the back. And that was the victory for me at that point. Nice. Uh, That's a good, yeah, a good kind of you, a good takeaway. Yeah. From it's like I got, I got some laughs in some way, shape, or form. It's exactly. funny how all these little inside jokes develop through that week. Oh you're yeah. Getting to know people you've never met before, yep. and you're becoming friends. And mm-hmm. then from the beginning of the week, you're kind of like chummy. You're respectful. By the mm-hmm. end of the week, you're kind of you know teasing each other. I think the last night, <clears throat> the guy who was in first place, I think his microphone drops out or something happens technically, mm-hmm. his mic falls on the ground, he plugs it in, it doesn't work, he fiddles with it, it comes back and he goes, hello, hello, and it finally works, he goes, good thing I'm winning. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, the comics in the back know the standings, they know where everybody, yep. so they laugh at, the audience doesn't necessarily know what he's talking yep. about. Yep, I, re- I think I remember that. I'm trying to remember who that was that did that. Uh, I believe his name was Al Park. Al was Park. his name. Yeah, and he, he yeah. just gives a, a real nonchalant, good thing I'm winning. Yeah. You know, everybody in the back laughs. The audience is like, oh, okay. But yeah. We all got, got a kick out of it. So what? it's just such a pressure cooker of a week. It is. That Especially when you go into it sort of optimistic for the people. Like You see the number of people who are really great comedians that have won it and stuff like that. And the people Definitely. Really big, big names have done that festival. Yeah. And you think to yourself, oh, if I can be one of the, the people who wins it or even makes the finals, even that's a really cool deal. Mm-hmm. Um, and you kind of put yourself in that echelon for just a moment. And so that optimism, which is kind of the optimism you get into comedy for is to be this great comedian and to finally have it sort of realized in your head for even just that moment, that amount of hope will destroy you if you don't actually make it so much farther. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the fun thing is, it's, uh, and I have a fun story about uh, fuck Louis C.K. I definitely want to start this that way. But back <laughs> when he was at his height, um, and we all thought he was the greatest comedian, he stopped into the comedy underground in the middle of the Seattle International Comedy Competition auditions. Um, like, these are the comedians from Seattle and Portland that are trying to get in. And he stops in in the middle and does a 45-minute set in the middle of the auditions and like i said he is and he opens the entire thing by looking at the comics in the back and saying just an fyi to everyone who's here right now no matter what you do tonight none of it matters even a little bit for what you do as far as even if you win this competition it doesn't fucking matter for what you become (laughs) as a comedian not a real coach carter talk Yep, exactly. It's just the opposite of what we all wanted to hear. I mean, <laughs> uh, Louis C.K., a uh, mental note, remind me to never ask you to do my eulogy, if, yeah, uh, exactly. if that's okay. Yeah, I mean, you weren't invited anyway, but... <laughs> <laughs> if you want to pop into my eulogy and you're thinking of doing a tight 45, uh, I'm going to have you sit this one out. Yeah. Not exactly the best. Yeah. The, the, the best funniest story. part to me has always been the person who had to follow Louis C.K. in the middle of that situation, because they... Li- Literally, he was like, hey, can, and you don't say no when it's like, like if, uh, if Seinfeld or something like that popped in and we're like, hey, I got to work on this. We go as long as you want. We don't care. We're, we have a small comedy club in the middle of Seattle. We're just happy you're here. Mm-hmm. Wow, so, that's weird. That, that yeah. is a weird story. It was. It was a weird, it was a weird moment. Um, but yeah. Strange. Yeah. So, so you were, when did you start working at the underground or become, pretty, you were the general quick. manager when I was there last. Yeah. It was uh, let's see. General manager. I mean, let's see. I, I started working there in like 2013, 2014 as door person, made my way up to assistant manager, got fired. Um, hmm. And then I didn't come back for about, I think a year uh, until that manager was gone, came back made door person again, made assistant manager again, got fired. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and each of, let, let me be clear. Each of these times, the first time was, 
it was kind of just a happenstance situation where he put me in charge of the club for a weekend so that he could go do co cocaine and do another comedy. He wasn't even getting paid at the other comedy club he was doing. Uh, he was just doing cocaine with another comedy manager <laughs> and calling it a feature weekend at another comedy club, and <laughs> I'm, I, which I'm not better. Don't worry about it. And so he leaves this 24-year-old in charge of this club, and I just get this fucking diva of a headliner. John Fox doesn't book a feature for the weekend. Instead, he's trying to fill it with guest spots. Mm unpaid guest spots and these are real feature comedians that like are actually naturally throwing headliners they show up thinking they're about to do 20 minutes and get paid they find out they're not getting paid and 50 percent of them just leave and sure. so i'm now in a situation where i'm running this club for the first time nervous and all that and now i have to go on stage and do either 10 or 15 minutes uh and then put the guy who's working the door in for the other 15 and the which wasn't the problem. I actually had a great set that weekend, um, but the headliner hated it. He was one of the, he, he sat there like, I do fucking sold out arenas and shit. Like he had an Australian accent and he hated, hmm. like there was a point in time where he actually threatened to walk out of the entire building um, <laughs> before he went on stage. Uh, the host was also going super long. He was one of those New York comedians that's open for Chappelle. And he would do time in between every fucking set. And it, he took like five minutes between these sets, which I know is a normal practice for other, for other venues. But literally, this headliner hated it. And I had no authority to him as just a 24-year-old who's like, hey, could you like not do that? <laughs> and so he did it every time. During one of the five-minute sets, the headliner threatened to walk out. That was one of the nights that uh, uh, one of the guest spots actually showed up. And I was like, just a heads up. You might have to go back out there and work on – like, they were working on material mostly. And mm -hmm. I was like, you might have to go out there and do your set. Don't worry. We'll definitely pay you, which I didn't know what, whether they would or not. I was just like, I got to cover the space. And the very last night there, um, the Sunday, uh, I worked Thursday, Friday, Saturday – the old general, the old manager comes in and just gets reamed by the headliner for what I had been doing the entire oh. <laughs> time because of the circumstances and stuff like that. He fires me in this cocaine addled, just crazy cycle of, I thought I could trust you. I could lose. And it was, it was that's how I lost the job the first time. Second mm. time I caught the manager stealing uh, while I was working the door. Mm. Like I was, I was doing the numbers and I found that the numbers were $600 in cash short of what I wrote down. Um, and I was, and he, he was trying to have me sign for it. I was like, Hey, um, this is $600 short. And he was like, yeah, that's uh, money that we take for the general manager slash cook, but that just stays between us two managers, which by the way is what I'm counting as me becoming an assistant manager again. And I tell you, we have ourselves another little manager talk. Once yep, they, as you yep, exactly. Uh, and so I got fired for telling the owner about it. Um, and well, that who guy fired was, you, though? The, 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 the manager guy had the authority to fire you? What about the no, owner? The though? manager had the authority to fire me. <laughs> I didn't come back for like, I think it was like four months before. The other shitty thing was, was that guy didn't get fired. Um, he actually rage quit eventually because he wasn't allowed access to the money anymore. <laughs> <laughs> for obvious reasons, but they didn't fire him. Um, I came back uh, and then I was immediately assistant manager and that guy worked himself to the bone uh, and never gave me a single shot, which fine. Uh, Mike Maslati, I don't know if you know him, but awesome dude. He did some awesome things. Yeah, I know that. Who is that? Um, he, that runs, uh, he runs a podcast station down in LA and Seattle and he just had his dry bar special up. Mike's one of my favorite people in the world. I know that name. I can't picture the face, but yeah, I no. definitely know that name. Um, but I was his assistant for a good period of time. That was an awesome relationship. Lasted for about a year before he moved to LA. Um, I took a, or no, I didn't want the job because I was, I was working on the road at that point. I was like, I don't think I need to be the, because it looked awful. It looked really bad. Uh, I didn't even want the manager job. And so they brought back the guy who fired me for catching him stealing and he hired me as an assistant manager. 
he quit within three weeks because he didn't have access to the money again. And then they promoted me to manager. And then I got into a huge screaming match after like set the old GM uh, of the comedy. Sorry to uh, throw my entire uh, work history on you, but I, I might need new work soon. I want people to see why there are gaps in my resume. <laughs> I think they should all be on your resume. No update um, your, your Indeed online resume. This should all be in there. Yeah, so it says here that you worked between 2013 to 14 at the Comedy <laughs> Underground, took six months off, worked there again, <laughs> took six months off, worked there again. What what happened at that time? Well, I'm seeing I've the got... term cocaine addled a lot on your uh, yeah. resume. Ironically sprinkled in quite a bit. Yep, yeah. um, and I... The, the fun thing is, is that I have worked in the Comedy Underground for a long period of time. I think I've seen cocaine two times the whole entire time, which is a very small amount for how often I've been there. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know wh wh where people were doing it, but they, they were real crafty about getting into secluded yeah. situations to do it. Well, you know, it's like they always say, this isn't your daddy's cocaine user anymore. Yeah. People uh, have gotten smart. I love a good chaos is ensuing, yet mm -hmm. the audience doesn't know it uh, story going yeah. on from a club. I was, I was, I was <laughs> going to, this is when I was living in Salt Lake city and David tell is in town and mm -hmm. the show, you know, big show, it sells out of course. And the mm -hmm. club puts their main, their main guys on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, so you got, we got our host we got the feature and then David tell and the host of course is going to milk the shit out of this. Yep. The host is doing 25 minutes up top what? going, going long. He must have done, no joke, about 20-ish minutes up top. Feature goes up, does his time, keeps it, keeps it regular. Uh, host goes back up. I'm not kidding you. Did another like 10 or 15 minutes before uh, David Tell, the headliner. David Tell comes up and goes, hey, everybody, thanks for having me on Marcus's show. <laughs> and, yeah. Which, is the name of the, which was the name of the host at the time. Of course, everybody in the back, you know, is laughing. The audience yes. doesn't really know what's going on. But I was like, is this, whose show is this? <laughs> I love That's it. That's crazy. Yeah. I can't imagine that ever, like that is one of the most fun horror stories I've ever heard. In yeah. And, and the host of course was, you know, getting big laughs. He was doing his number one stuff because he wanted to, yeah. to get the, to milk it with the great crowd and all. But it's yeah. like, David tells like, thanks for having me on Marcus's show. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I loved it. God damn. A good, a good chaos ensuing and the audience knows nothing of it. Yeah. Going yep. on sort of story. Well, you mm -hmm. said, before we talked that you had been like out of work since March yep. because of the club. So tell me what, what the club did for all this stuff. It shut down. Did it attempt? Yep, it completely shut down. Um, it completely March, shut down. When did it yep. shut down? Uh, March 16th um, was the last oh, day. That right, right at the start of it. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Oh yeah. No, uh, we haven't had live um, music or anything like that here in uh, Washington. I think June was the official ban of outdoor um, live music and stuff like that and live mm -hmm. performances because the thought is is that like we've been going in phases throughout Washington but we haven't been doing any sort of like if somebody could come from another county that was like the most dangerous of the counties and bring the coronavirus over to those counties it's just going to spread it more so mm -hmm. they've been right. like any so that's sort of thinking. yeah any sort was of there any, like was, was the closing of a club state mandated? Was this the business's decision? Um, I mean, I was, uh, that was actually probably the last day I would have worked there. Um, mm -hmm. I, and I let Fox know that, that we had to shut down like pretty much. I, I, I mean, we expected the word to come down that we were, everything was going to be shut down anyways. And it, and it did see. that day. Um, but I let him know that just a heads up that, we have to shut down. There's no way to keep people safe in this situation. And this is really a big deal. Um, so even if uh, it didn't come down from, uh, from uh, the governor, it would have been shut down, or at least I, I, would have, I would have shut things down and they'd have had to figure out a new GM, new situation completely. Um, because I mean, I have to, 
I, I also had the staffs back and stuff like that and they had mine. So it was kind of one of those things where it's like, you can't really force us to go back to work in sure. dangerous conditions. So is there a, now fast forward to January, is there a, a timeline? Is there any plan limited nope. capacity? Do we have anything yet? Still? There's technically a limited capacity. I know that Tacoma Comedy Club is doing, uh, you're allowed to have six people at a show. Um, so, oh. they, so they are. Well, if you're talking my shows, six people, sell out. Hello, yeah, headliner. Exactly. <laughs> Max capacity, huge bringer show. Um, I'm, yeah. a ma- I'm a massive draw. Uh, yeah. But they're doing, uh, they're doing that and you have to pay 200 bucks for the six people to watch. Uh, like, mm. I think they've been putting up like five comedians. So you could have, they can do a full dodgeball game with the number of audience members and comedians if they yeah, want to. Six on six. Yeah. And I know that they've got the space over to come a comedy club to really make that happen. Just move mm. some tables. Be great. Yeah. Um, yeah might as well. So, so, so that's we got a couple, the, some very small changes at the most. Yeah. So um, that's it. That's pretty much all that's going on. We are right now negotiating the lease with the people, uh, the building people for the comedy underground. We've kind of been on borrowed time there to begin with. They, they've been trying to put in condos and stuff like that. And they're upping rent on us, even though we haven't been able to make money since March. Oh, wow. Uh, I and they've been charging rent the whole entire time. Um, and wow. any relief that we have gotten isn't nearly enough to, like, I think we were able to cover half of one month um, mm-hmm. in rent with the uh, small business loan that we got from the government. So yeah. uh, we've just been just huge loss at, at, just across the board because there's no way to make money. Yeah, club, uh, comedy clubs, theaters, bars and restaurants, of course. There's no. just no option. No. No. You're closed. You are losing money by the second. Yep. The staff can't work. The re- It's not like the rent got turned off too. Exactly. It it's, is, it is the worst yeah, situation you can imagine. Just you can't, you are government mandated to mm-hmm. not work. Yep. There's yep. nothing here in Los Angeles. We had the outdoor dining for a while mm-hmm. and restaurants really did really well with it. They set up the outdoor stuff. Yeah. Some of the uh, cities kind of closed down the streets for them to put their outdoor stuff. So we had this sort of like this, like, um, state fair sort of vibe where yeah. you could be outside <laughs> people are walking around on the streets i was like hey this is kind of cool it's all right everybody's out they're safe this is a good way to go and then we, and then that got shut down <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Uh, about six that, weeks of it part. maybe two months of it so mm-hmm. that that all went away but that was a nice in between i thought for a while and businesses were were able to at least kind of work but yeah. then we even then we lost that even would be amazing yeah, I was I was yeah. hoping they were breaking even and maybe we could keep this up until we can go back to back to indoors, but nope, we lost that too. Yep. <laughs> that was that was our wild pitch. Now it's yep. now it's in the backstop. So and the how- other aspect is, is that I am in favor of everything shutting down. Like if they'd have just paid us to stay indoors for eight weeks to begin this entire thing, we'd be in so much better shape right now. Yeah, um, maybe if if we're if we were paid to stay indoors, then at least we would yeah. not have lost the, you know, the rent, the workability. Yeah. And then we could have reassessed from there. Yeah. And I mean, we, that's what they did in all the other countries. It's strange that this is yeah. the one where they're like, hey, just a heads up. If you're a small business owner, you're fucked. The small there business is. owners, yeah, definitely seemed like the uh, the pawn in the the big chess match yeah. of it all. Because here in California or Los Angeles, you know, movie productions are operating with with regulations, of course, mm-hmm. but they're, course. they're, they're working and stuff. So it kind of makes sense. He would say like, well, can we have some regulations and we'll stay open or we'll, mm-hmm. what about, uh, what about, um, Pollo Loco? <laughs> can we, <laughs> can we all, uh, wear the mask and, but just keep it business as usual. So it's been yeah. a mess. It's been quite yeah. the blender of, of messes. Yeah. yeah. How long has the comedy underground been there in that current location? Current location, 10 years. Um, I've been there for about seven. So I see. Yeah. Wow. So, and where was it before that location there? It was actually just down the street. 
Um, oh. If you go down the street, um, like we're located between First and Second Avenue. Over on Second Avenue, just on the the brick building, like just adjacent, like uh, one street over, there's a giant um, billboard that says, or actually on the on the brick wall, it actually says Comedy Underground, and it gives a different location than the one we're at, and it's right beneath it um, because we were just down the street at a, what's now a flat stick brewery, um, and. So we just like the fact that we got that location and that there were two that close together is insane. But it's also crazy that it's been 10 years and we haven't taken down that painting of a different <laughs> location uh, for the Comedy Underground. We're like, ah, they just know it's a Comedy Underground. Right. Yeah. They just know. Yeah. Such a landmark, such a staple before I ever lit or before I ever performed there or did a bunch of stand up on the road. I always knew Comedy Underground. I knew yeah. the name. Yeah. I knew the names. You know, it's one of those clubs, you know, the names of all the like the six to eight biggest clubs in the country. Mm -hmm. And that one is definitely one of them. So I hope they get back to your feet, but get back on their feet when things normalize again, when we eventually round third. Oh, yeah. I, th that's one of the worst parts about uh, it potentially closing permanently in that location is I, I mean, I recorded my comedy album there and there was no other place I ever wanted to do it. Um, and it's so strange, like that, that, the night that I uh, recorded my album or that weekend, I had some of the best sets of my entire life. And it's just gonna be so strange if that tur turns into condos and that ends up being a parking garage right where my greatest moment happened. We're like, hey, what was the moment where you really felt connected to what you wanted to do with your entire life? I'm like. You see well, where that Civic is now? Right yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. 34D. It is. <laughs> well, you know how when they knock down a stadium, but they'll yeah. like make a landmark of where like the Immaculate Reception happened or where the yeah. Foxborough kick happened. It's just an X in a parking lot. They should do that for like your best set. And they should mark an yeah. X of the condo or the parking structure, right? Where that way you'll always know you can go to the spot. Yep. Yeah. And I actually did... Uh... I did a quote unquote comedy special in the beginning of this pandemic to raise money for the employees that were laid off um, during the pandemic. And I was trying to raise money for it. And I, I went pretty all out with it. And the end of it was me finally getting to put my picture up on the wall with all the great comedians that had been there uh, the entire time. But now I'm just saying that like, I mean, I was hoping that that picture would still be there when people came back and now I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to remove this picture and just remember that I did this ridiculous thing in a basement with no one, um, <laughs> which is a way worse situation. Uh, <laughs> so you did a charity thing just to get your picture on the wall? Yep. Yeah. Well, I also kind of like, it's sort of been like, I've kind of expected that this may have been the end. And I always want to do a real special at the Comedy Underground. And so I literally took, I went to Home Depot and I bought, I think over a hundred brooms. Um, and I put, uh, we spray painted, we made a template and spray painted faces on all of them. I, I uh, taped them up to all the brooms and I did a special for an entire audience full of brooms. Oh, um, yeah, which yeah. was, which just, one of my highlights of the whole pandemic was going into Home Depot and not knowing where the brooms were and having to ask somebody and just being like, so I'm going to need all of your brooms. And they're like, oh, you mean you need like five, six brooms for like a project at a, and I'm like, no, I need a hundred brooms. And they're like, why? And I was just like, let me just let you know, I didn't expect life to go this way. And they <laughs> I'm just going to tell you right now, nothing I can answer that question with is going to satisfy yeah. your the fun, and I, I, I said, I'm going to need all of your brooms. And also, what is your return policy on brooms? On because, all the brooms. <laughs> yeah. Because I did bring them back. Um, and it was, I spent $600 on brooms. And then I brought them all back at the same time. And the return people were so nice, except for one guy that was just like, but why? Why would it happen like this? <laughs> like, and then, uh, you know, like you see that there's uh, one or two seats that aren't filled with brooms. They're like, does anybody have a dustpan? Get a dustpan in that empty <laughs> seat. We need a sellout. God damn it. I don't care what yep. it takes. Yep, exactly. Me, one of those you do with one hand, you sweep with the one hand and you try and uh, 
I did have up a little line of dust for the next 15 minutes. Yep. I, I absolutely did have one. Of those. I can appreciate that. I can pre- appreciate creativity when it comes to selling out a room. You got to, hey, you got to you know think what? outside Whenever, the box. I do still have all of the paper plates from that night. Um, and yeah. why I'm not totally sure at this point, I kind of was <laughs> thinking that I would be able to do this whole, uh, quote unquote merch pitch where I told them about this room story as a bit. And now I'm just like, now I'm just a guy with a bunch of paper plate faces in his room. And that's crazy. That's a mm-hmm. crazy situation. Yeah. <laughs> I like it though. I like the hustle though. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Well, I thought it would be good to wrap this up with the Rotten Tomatoes head to head movie game with you. I got to tell you, last person I did this with went perfect, went three for three. So how many so people you got your work cut that? out? I is think about three or four. Person? Okay. I think three or, let's see, one, two, three. I think five in total. Okay. Well, it's sort of like the, the Super Bowl. It was the uh, NFL championship for a few years before mm-hmm. it turned into the Super Bowl. Okay. And then that's effectively when we start counting history. So there's okay. a little bit of that. So I, I call it five, five right. people. So right. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a couple movies head to head and you're going to try and guess which one has the higher rotten tomato score okay. all, all fine and dandy, but this is the Pacific Northwest edition okay. of the head to head given, given our Seattle talks. Okay. Our first one had a, uh, our first matchup, real simple Seattle edition. We got from 1993 Sleepless in Seattle versus from 1999, 10 Things I Hate About You. Oh, shit. Oh, oh, you did that. Oh, mm. I got to go. Which with- is 10 Things I Hate About You is in Seattle, right? I mean, if you were to tell yeah. someone who's never been to Seattle, this is Seattle, you would fool 99 out of 100 people with that. There's also the part of me that's like, I, I like, those are equivalent movies. You've really, you've done a dastardly thing right here. Um, I oh, am. I'm not going to make this easy on you. This is going to be tough. Good. This is not going to be no jog through the woods chasing your dad. <laughs> this is not a trail run that my dad takes you on. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I will go with Sleepless in Seattle. Okay. Sleepless in Seattle is the pick. Sleepless in Seattle is 75%. 10 things I hate about you. 69 percent you're no. one for one oh, yeah. Robert. yeah okay one for one all right okay category number two this is the rain category okay movie number one from 1998 hard rain versus from 2007 rain on me little twist there i'm going rain on me I don't know either of these movies, so I'm just going to go with Rain on Me because it sounds more, uh, what's the word? One sounds like an action movie and the other one sounds like an actual artist piece and I feel like Rotten Tomatoes will just go with that one. Oh, okay. That's good. You're thinking like a critic now. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if you're right. Hard Rain, 1998, 30% on Rotten Tomatoes. Rain Over Me, 64%. Yeah, I was right. right. Yes, uh, predictable. Uh, I don't want to tell everybody what they already know when it comes to movie buffs, but Hard Rain stars a Christian Slater. I don't know if uh, people are familiar with the artistic works of Christian Slater. (laughs) He's in Hard Rain. Uh, Okay, last head-to-head. You can go three for three here. This category is big tech. Okay, 1994, the movie is disclosure okay. versus from 1982 tron Ooh, what is wrong also i don't know when the last time you saw disclosure was but this was the I perfect era oh you never seen disclosure never, i was five i was five years old when that came out so we're, we're asking uh but and i know tron is but did it do well on rotten toma- tomatoes now Mm -hmm. Ooh, okay like my whole gauge is a movie title take me through your thought process here you're flying blind here what's what's going on in your head so my whole entire thing is that tron i know what tron is in general 
Like that, it's a timeless uh, classic disclosure. I don't know anything about. So my whole gauge is, do I think that uh, Tron would be rated higher than 50%? And is that good enough to beat just a random movie that I don't know anything about? All and, right. well, I'm willing to tell you the actors in disclosure if you want. Uh, yes. Okay. That would definitely help. Okay. Let's, let's uh, go. Let's go for it. Okay. Lead in disclosure is Michael Douglas. Okay. The second lead is Demi Moore. Uh, the comedic foil, Dennis Miller, is in Disclosure. It sounds like a great movie, actually. This actually sounds pretty decent. Uh, Dennis okay. Miller has the great line. Well, the, the whole movie is Demi Moore um, sexually harasses Michael Douglas. I remember this. Okay. And he has to go into virtual reality. This is what we thought technology was in 1992. We thought everything was going to be virtual reality and, and virtual reality gloves. Uh -huh. So he has to go into virtual reality or something to like bust her or something like that. It's a very interesting me too before there was me too, what? but reverse the sexes. That's so weird movie. because I I, I remember seeing the commercial for that when I was five years old. And I don't remember, like, I only remember the sexual harassment aspect of it. Um, yeah, it's, and it's I an did interesting. Not know that they the oh, effort. that sounds awful. But it's that also sounds... great because Demi Moore is smoking hot in this movie and she's hitting on Michael Douglas. And at some point, Michael Douglas's assistant goes, why is she hitting on him? <laughs> <laughs> and then Dennis Miller like jumps in and goes, Ah, you didn't know him when I knew him, babe. He's seen more asses than a rental car. He, he does this line, and I start doubling over laughing. I was like, oh, that was Dennis Miller back then. Oh, right, oh, right. damn. I'm back in there. Versus Tron. Versus disclosure, Tron. Disclosure versus Tron. This is for the perfect record. See, that, that's the thing is I'm putting extra pressure on it because I've done well. If, if I was 0 for 3 right now, I would have just guessed by now. You're in the Seattle Comedy Competition. It's the final night. You're in the lead. However, not by much. Fuck. Okay. I'm going with Tron. I'm going with Tron. Fuck. I'm going with Tron. And I, I never thought that I would hedge a lot of hope to this. Okay. I'm locking you in on Tron. Disclosure score on Rotten Tomatoes is 59%. Okay. Tron score on Rotten Tomatoes, 72%. Yes! You got it. You're yes. three for three. Oh, go with the classics. All right. Always go with your first instinct. Oh. First instinct's always right. Man, it feels good to be uh, in the Pantheon. Damn. Yeah, well, you're in the you're, you're joining an elite crew. Damn right I am. Who, who am I joining? Rotten Tomatoes. Who are you joining? Uh, oh, I, you are joining my childhood friend that I interviewed a few weeks ago, who uh, who's making crazy VHS uh, notebooks. Awesome. Yeah, he takes the VHS and puts it on a notebook. So you can have a, a notebook with the cover of Stand By Me on it. That is exactly who <laughs> You and him. Say, my you expectations mean? were exceeded with that, uh, with, that, uh, with that description. Yes, sir. Yeah. Nice. Excellent. Three for three. Well. Yeah, this has been good. This has been a good catch up. You got to tell your your uh, your mom and dad. Uh, I will let them know that you say hi. And uh, by the way, that trail, we still run it. We still run that trail. I'm coming back to that trail one day, Robert. You, you should. Come back to the Seattle National Comedy Competition one of these days. All right. I'm, sure I'm, going, I'm, I'm going for a solid 12th this time. Yeah, fuck yeah. If Thanks, you go Robert. back into it, I'll go back into it. And we'll have a duking out of the people who took 15th place. Hmm. The, the battle for 15th. The battle for 15th. I like Actually, you know, that would be fun to get in and then really try to beat each other on who can take last. <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> and they say comedy is dead. Yep. Just start smoking indoors in each of, like, let, let's see really how far we can put. Push smoking. Yeah. All the, all the subject matter you can think of. Yep. Uh, you just go hard, hard yep. in the paint. It, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then when I get last place, I want your dad to hug me. God damn it. I want my hug. <laughs> We're each competing for whose hug means the most. I, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Robert. Talk to you soon. Uh, yeah. Talk to you soon, Patrick. That is the episode for this week, everybody. Running it back with Robert Pitty. Gosh, I want to thank him for joining. And that was a great conversation. I haven't talked to him in so long and it just feels like we just went right back into it. 
Good talk. I was interested to know a lot about his background before comedy. That's always what I'm most interested in, see how people lived before they took up comedy, what they're doing, especially this year with 2020. We've all had to get really creative with how we're going to keep pushing on, pursuing, making a living. Only the strong will survive. Maybe we should tag that as our year motto. Yeah, I'm giving it that. Hey, and how about that head-to-head Rotten Tomatoes score? We have two undefeated. I'm going to start making these games harder. They go full-on obscure 90s movies from now on. That's it. I'm getting tough on this game. No more free passes. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Check out the other shows if you can. Tell your friends. And next week, another show. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.